ندعو الاخ احمد علام والاخ محمد سالم رئيس مجموعة الأعمال الأمن السيبراني الأستاذ أحمد علام ومحمد سالم أخصائي الأمن السيبراني مجموعة الشرق الأوسط في مايكروسوفت الاثنين هم مجموعة الشرق الأوسط في مايكروسوفت فليتفضلون مشكورين. Okay, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. My name is أحمد علام. In an attempt to be a bit uh, inclusive as much as I can, I'm going to switch my speech to English. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm the business group lead for cybersecurity in the Middle East. I'm proudly based in Kuwait, but I'm covering all of the Middle East countries. I'm joined with my colleague, uh, Mohammed Selim, who is our cybersecurity consultant in Kuwait. Um, as you know, Microsoft has a very diverse portfolio of products and services, including data, AI, metaverse offerings, uh, compute, cloud, you name it. But for the interest of this audience and for what we're doing in Kuwait, our focus today will be basically in cybersecurity. So the main topic is security and even a specific topic in security which is going to be zero trust. Now, when we talk about zero trust, uh, what I would say is that it's a buzzword that has been used for the last couple of years, three years, um, and most of the security society is using this word. So my objective out of this session is to show you how Microsoft interprets zero trust. How do we break down zero trust? And most importantly, how do we help organizations and the government in Kuwait to achieve a zero trust framework? Now, most importantly, the thing that I want to say is the fact of life is that Kuwait has been put on an accelerated path for digital transformation in the last couple of years, namely with the start of COVID, namely in March 2020. And some of the drivers that are really putting us on this accelerated path on digital transformation are, as you can see on this screen, people requiring access to my internal applications are no longer my only employees. I'm talking about partners, I'm talking about my customers, I'm talking about outsourced employees. So it's not just about my internal employees requiring access, right? It's no longer about my corporate devices because anyone can come into my organization with a bring your own device mindset and they can basically require me to apply some controls on their devices to be able to work, right? From an application perspective, applications from an infra and an architecture perspective have changed. So most of the applications right now have APIs. They talk to each other. They integrate with other applications. They integrate with public cloud services. So applications have definitely and fundamentally changed. And when we talk about how work is done, I can work from anywhere right now. And this brings me to the summary, which is basically, the way we work have changed fundamentally. I can work from anywhere. And this is where we introduced the whole paradigm around remote work, right? The tools we use have fundamentally changed. As I mentioned, our apps have changed. And the, the devices we used have changed. And last but not least, the way we work. So we work very openly right now. We collaborate on tools like Microsoft Teams or WebEx or any other collaborative application. We share information, we send information, we receive information. So all of this, all of these parameters have changed the way we work. And with the way we work is changing, the risk of all the threats is arising as well. So as we change the way we work, the risk increases, right? And for that, we needed to take another approach for security. Right? So we needed to verify every single request that's accessing or requesting access to my applications or my resources. So everything has to be verified. Everything has to be given a least privilege. I cannot give all the privileges or let's say hurraya mutlaqa for anyone who wants to access my applications or my internal resources. Right? And for all my resources, I have to always assume breach. I cannot assume that any resource is safe. And this is where 
we came with the idea or, or the term of zero trust. I cannot trust any source or any resource to be fully and 100% secure. And if you look at what are the most critical assets for an organization, what are the most valuable assets for an organization? The first thing is my data. Data is the most critical assets. And the applications hosting the data is one of the most critical assets, assets as well. My infrastructure, my servers, my hardware, and of course my network. So the whole idea behind Zero Trust is that you build this framework, this policy engine. This policy engine has to be fed by AI, it has to be fed by machine learning, and then any resource that's trying to access my applications and my data needs to be verified. So if Muhammad Salem is trying to access my application, I need to make sure that Muhammad is the person accessing. And his device is healthy and his device is managed. Otherwise, it's not a secure sign-in session. So what is zero trust again? We define zero trust that every single request needs to be verified. Every single request needs to be secured and authenticated. And this is how we're doing it with Kuwait. And in partnership with the Central Agency for IT, or Al-Jahaz Al-Markazi Lil Technology al Malumat, what Microsoft is doing is basically helping government entities achieve a zero trust framework. And we do it in a phased approach. So we do what we call um, an envision, plan, and deliver, or a taqeem, a taqtit, and then a tatbiq. So we assess where an entity is in terms of their security maturity, and then we plan how can they achieve their zero trust framework, and then we basically go in and do the deployment. And the last message I want to leave you with before my colleague Mohammed Salem comes in and gives you more details about zero trust is whether your data is on the cloud, whether if it's on Microsoft Azure, whether if it's on-premise, whether if it's on another cloud, uh, cloud provider like AWS or GCP or another uh, uh, virtual machine provider like VMware, zero trust is technology agnostic. It doesn't require your data to be on Microsoft. It doesn't require data to be on AWS or whatever. Whatever, wherever your data is, zero trust policies will apply. And this is what we're doing with Kate and with the government entities to deploy zero trust across the government. And with that, I'll leave it the floor to Mohammed Salem. Thank you. Okay. Securing the digital transformation. This is a very important topic, how we can secure the digital transformation. Securing a digital transformation cannot happen without having a strong zero trust foundation. What is having a strong zero trust foundation? It's basically based on these three pillars. How you can secure the hybrid workforce. Second, how you can modernize the identity and device management. And third one is how we can transform the employee experience. When we have these three pillars in place, we can say that we have a strong zero trust foundation. So let's take a look at each pillar and see how this can help us to have a better security for our zero trust journey. So first, we start by the, zero, by the securing the hybrid workforce. What is securing hybrid workforce? Of course, security is very important. But as you see, statistics say 68% of business leaders feel that the cyber security risk are increasing. Not only this, but the change that we have the past period of how our workers are working remotely, we need to provide the security that will make sure that they are secured. And this is why securing the hybrid workforce is very important. So we need to provide the remote access in a secured manner that will make sure they are secured, whether they are in the office or outside of the office. In addition, we need to make sure we secure their devices and application. When we enable models like the bring your own device model, for example. Not, not only this, but we need to make sure we are protecting the corporate resources, how we are controlling the applications. If you want to take a look, or if you want to apply this, what is the strategy? The strategy basically starts with these four elements. First, how can I verify the user identities? And to be able to verify the user identity, you need a very strong authentication method in place. Second, how you can get insights about the devices. I need to make sure that the device that is accessing my application is a compliant device. 
So it doesn't mean if I have the password that I can access any application. The device is a very important factor. But this needs to be considered in place. And then how we can configure what we call adaptive access policy. What is adaptive access policy? So I am, when I'm trying to access any application, the solution automatically will look at the user, the device, the application, and where I'm logging in from. Based on this, it will start in applying machine learning to decide, is it really Muhammad who is claiming he is? Even if he is using the password, should I give him access or not? And if the artificial intelligence engine decides that this is a good session or a legitimate session, it will give me access. If not, it will automatically deny access or can challenge me by multi-factor authentication. Or even, at some cases, we can limit the access. We can give access as a read-only session. This, not only for Microsoft Cloud application, these capabilities, you can have it for your cloud applications, whether they are Microsoft, any cloud solution provider, and your on-prem web applications as well. Then, how we can, this is the first pillar of having a security trust foundation. The second one is how we can modernize the identity and endpoint management, which is a very important. Modernizing the identity and endpoint management, the benefits are very clear. More security, more reliability, more flexibility. But if we take a look, يعني, or the statistics say 81% of business leaders feel the pressure that they need to lower the security cost. So we are in a challenge that we want to improve the security to prevent the attacks from our on-prem infrastructure. The on-prem infrastructure is the common attack vector, means all the attackers know what it takes to get down an on-prem infrastructure. But when we modernize and start moving our identities and devices to the cloud, we are getting the security and the resilience of the cloud, which means we will be more secured. In addition to this, modernizing your identity and endpoints will provide IT efficiency, meaning you will save cost for the IT maintenance, operation, updates, all of the stuff that we are doing on a daily operations. On top of this, will help you to accelerate your digital trust, uh, your uh, digital transformation. You will be focusing only on the important IT projects, on the strategic IT projects, forgetting about our daily operations that we used to do. So if we want to apply a modernization for our identity and endpoints, what should be following? First, we need to modernize the authentication and manage the identities in the cloud. Not meaning that we will take your identities to the cloud, but we will be extending the identities that you have on-prem with the security capabilities of the cloud. In addition to this, you will be managing the devices from the cloud. These devices can be company-owned devices, can be my device, so bring your own device, can be mobile devices, can be any device. You will be managing all the devices from one place. And then, how you can improve visibility and unify the experience of all your applications. So by having a couple of Microsoft solutions like Azure Active Directory and Microsoft Endpoint Manager, I will have control over all the applications in my organization. This application might be cloud, might be on-prem, might be migrated applications to the cloud, or might be desktop or mobile applications. I will be overlooking all of these applications from one place. And then, third part or third pillar of having a, a strong identity foundation is how we can transform the employee experience. At the end, we cannot secure everything and leave this poor employee cannot access his resources, cannot work. In 2020, after the pandemic, one of the statistics said 49 million remote workers reported that it takes them days and might go to weeks to resolve small IT problems. So it's very important that we provide security and in the same time, we make sure that we improve the productivity. And this is the first pillar of transforming the employee experience. How we can provide a seamless sign-in experience, how the users can access their application in a nice way. In addition, how we can reduce the IT friction, which means if the user needs to do anything in his daily operations, he don't need to go for the IT to do this. No, he can do it on his own. And then, which is a very important factor, how we can foster collaboration. Collaboration not only with internal users, it's not me want to collaborate with my user or with my colleague. It's about collaboration with external parties. And we'll take a look at this in the next slide. But if we want to transform our employee experience, what we should be starting with? First, you need to have a streamlined provisioning experience. For example, with Windows Autopilot, once any employee joined the company, I will be giving them devices. 
Once they log in on this device, they will have all the applications installed automatically. Their access will be granted for what they need to do at work. In addition to this, all the applications in the organization will be connected together with one single password, applying all the security controls we spoke about. Thus, and then how we can reduce the IT overhead by providing self-service experience. This is, for example, for us in Microsoft, yani when we want to reset our passwords, when you forget about passwords, we don't go to anyone. We have our own portal, as you can see. This own portal include all my security info, include my password if I want to change my password, include the devices that is registered with the organization that I can access, for example, my email from. So I do everything from here. I don't need to go for the IT to do anything. Type. What about when employees need to work with partners? All of us depend on partners to deliver. How we can collaborate with partner in a secured manner? And this is what Microsoft business to business solutions can help you do with. You can have inside your organization, invite partners with their own identity, with their own email, but you will be controlling their access. And then once you control their access, you can give them access to data. You can chat with them. You can have voice meetings, whatever you would like to do, but in a seamless, secured experience. And with this, you have an overview about having a strong zero trust foundation. It will help you secure your hybrid workforce, will help you modernize identity and endpoint, and then will help you to transform the employee experience. If one of the, Lord, one of the a very big company want to make a, a use case of zero trust or want to elevate its security, future security strategy, it will be looking for a security strategy that is flexible and scalable. And we can't have, a, 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 what Siemens is the perfect example to refer here. Siemens is the one of the largest company in the world. Siemens usually acquires many uh, entities inside its organization. So it's have a lot of different technology together, which make, it, which, make, which make it harder for them to have a security strategy by solution. And this is when they decided to acquire or to adapt the Zero Trust framework. And with Microsoft solution, they fulfilled all their needs with Microsoft. So this give us an overview about how we can have a zero trust. What is zero trust? Zero trust is about having a unified security policy that will provide visibility, analytics, automation across all the entities of your uh, environment. So it will provide this for the identities, for the endpoints, for your data, for the applications, for your network, and for your infrastructure. All of this depends that you verify explicitly for every request that is coming, and you assume that you are under breach. And what I want to end with, no, no matter where the request originates from or where it is located, you always have to verify and never trust anyone. Thank you very much. If you have any question, uh, please let me know.